23. The beginning of work. It is an exceedingly difficult task to keep up with the Swami in his travels following upon the Parliament of Religions. His lecture to Tinder the Bureau carried him far and wide. But his travels, while going about delivering lectures and holding parlour meetings and class talks on his own account, were even more varied. Within the short time of a year he had visited practically every city of consequence from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River and had given innumerable lectures, both public and private, the reports of most of which are unfortunately not available now. Wherever he went, he went as a guest. In Detroit he was for about four weeks the guest of Mrs. John J. Bagley, the widow of the ex-governor of Michigan and a lady of rare culture and unusual spirituality. She often said that during this time the Swami constantly expressed the highest in word and action, and that his presence was a continual benediction. After leaving Mrs. Bagley, he spent two weeks as the guest of the Ho Thomas W. Palmer, the President of the World's Fair Commission and formerly a U.S. Senator and the Minister of his country to Spain. When not travelling or answering invitations coining from all directions, he was frequently the guest of Mr. George W. Hale of Chicago. After giving a series of lectures in the Unitarian Church at Detroit in February, the Swami spent the months of March, April and May of 1894, alternately in Chicago and New York and Boston. June he spent in Chicago, while during the midsummer months, he delivered a series of lectures at Greenacre in New England, where the Greenacre Conferences were being inaugurated and before which he had been asked to speak. Here a group of earnest students gathered round him and the Swami expounded the Vedanta philosophy as they sat in oriental fashion under a venerable pine tree, since called the Swami's Pine. These conferences became widely known through the School of Comparative Religions conducted there by Dr. Louis G. Jaynes, who was long the president of the Brooklyn Ethical Association. Following upon his work in Greenacre, where he left an indelible impression, the Swami visited on invitation various intellectual and society people in the cities and suburbs of Boston, Chicago and New York. In this way he spent the autumn, visiting Baltimore and Washington at the end of October. In November he went to New York again. His previous visits to the city had been only casual, as a guest in the homes of friends. He had given a few public lectures, but was not yet in a position to begin regular work. It was at this time that he met Dr. Louis G. Jaynes, mentioned above, who was so much struck with his unusual attainments as well as with his message that he invited him at once to give a series of lectures on the Hindu religion before the Brooklyn Ethical Association. This the Swami accepted. From that time until death separated them, he and Dr. James were fast friends. His first lecture in Brooklyn before that association ensured him immediate success. A large and enthusiastic audience greeted him on that night, the last night of the year, to listen to his lecture on Hinduism and as the Swami, in his long robe and turban, expounded the ancient religion of his native land, the interest grew so deep that at the close of the evening there was an insistent demand for regular classes in Brooklyn. The Swami acceded, and a series of class meetings were held and several public lectures were given at the Pouch Mansion, where the Ethical Association held its meetings, and elsewhere. Of his appearance before the Brooklyn Ethical Society, the Brooklyn Standard writes, It was the voyeur of the ancient rishis of the Vedas, speaking sweet words of love and toleration through the Hindu monk, Parnyahnisa Swami Vivekananda, that held spellbound every one of those many hundreds who had accepted the invitation of the Brooklyn Ethical Society and packed the large lecture hall and the adjoining rooms of the Pouch Gallery on Clinton Avenue to overflowing, 
on the 30th December 1894, men of all professions and callings, doctors and lawyers and judges and teachers, together with many ladies, had come from all parts of the city to listen to his strangely beautiful and eloquent defense of the religion of India, and they were not disappointed. Swami, I master or rabbi or teacher, Vivekananda is even greater than his fame. He was a splendid type of the famous sages of the Himalayas, a prophet of a new religion combining the morality of the Christians with the philosophy of the Buddhists. Whatever else may be said of the Swami's lecture or address, for it was spoken extemporaneously, it was certainly intensely interesting. This series of lectures constituted the real beginning of the Swami's work in America. He had already anticipated the serious character of his future activity by breaking away from social invitations and establishing himself in quarters of his own in the city of New York. He was tired and disgusted with the fame he had acquired, and he felt that the interest he had awakened was not what he wanted, to his mind it was too superficial. He desired earnest-minded followers, whom he could teach freely, while living independently in a place of his own. For this reason he announced classes and lectures free of charge, himself paying expenses with the money he had gained in his lecturing tours. Many came, some from curiosity, others from earnest sincerity to learn the ancient teachings of India and the all-embracing character of its philosophy and, above all, to hear the constant lessons of the Swami on a worldwide universal toleration. Miss S. E. Waldo of Brooklyn, who became one of the Swami's foremost disciples, and well known under the name of Sister Haridasi, writes as follows, taking up the thread of her narrative from the time of his lecture before the Ethical Association. A few of those who had heard him in Brooklyn now began to go to the place where he lived in New York. It was just an ordinary room on the second floor of a lodging house. The classes grew with astonishing rapidity, and as the little room filled to overflowing it became very picturesque. The Swami himself sat on the floor and most of his audience likewise. The marble-topped dresser, the arms of the sofa and even the corner washstand helped to furnish scats for the constantly increasing numbers. The door was left open and the overflow filled the hall and sat on the stairs. And those first classes. How intensely interesting they were I who that was privileged to attend them can ever forget them. The Swami so dignified yet so simple, so gravely earnest, so eloquent, and the close ranks of students, forgetting all inconveniences, hanging breathless on His every word. It was a fit beginning for a movement that has since grown to such grand proportions. In this unpretentious way did Swami Vivekananda inaugurate the work of teaching Vedanta philosophy in New York. The Swami gave His services free as a. The rent was paid by voluntary subscriptions, and when these were found insufficient, the Swami hired a hall and gave secular lectures on India and devoted the proceeds to the maintenance of the classes. He said that Hindu teachers of religion felt, it to be their duty to support their classes and the students too, if they were unable to care for themselves, and the teachers would willingly make any sacrifice they possibly could to assist a needy disciple. The classes began in February, 1895, and lasted until June, but long before that time they had outgrown their small beginnings and had removed downstairs to occupy an entire parlor floor and extension. The classes were held nearly every morning and on several evenings in every week. Some Sunday lectures were also given and there were question classes to help those to whom the teaching was so new and strange that they were desirous to have an opportunity for more extended explanation. It is touching to find the Swami teaching Americans of wealth and position in the fashion of the ancient gurus. Though they had money, he would not make a single charge. 
religion to his mind ought to be given free, for it was something not to be bartered but realized. Though it is true that regular classes did not begin until February of the year 1895, yet numbers of visitors flocked to him constantly. The Swami now felt that he was carrying on his message, slowly, perhaps, but surely, in the right way. Formerly he had stood merely in the limelight, which to the superficial mind means success. But the Swami knew better for he had within him the sannyasin instinct for sounding the reality and worth of things. He abandoned readily the surroundings and the invitations of persons of wealth and social position for the simple and yet intense life which he deemed necessary for the spread of the cause. At this time he worked more strenuously than ever, he gave his whole time to teaching by means of talks and lectures, and regularly every day trained some chosen followers how to quiet the mind in the silence of meditation. Teaching his auditors how to meditate, he would himself drift into the meditative state, and oftentimes so deeply that he could not readily be brought back to normal consciousness. When the Swami emerged from such states, he would feel impatient with himself, for he desired that the teacher should be uppermost in him, rather than the yogi. In order to avoid repetitions of such occurrences, he instructed one or two how to bring him back by uttering a word or a name, should he be carried by the force of meditation into samadhi. Often he would be found singing Sanskrit hymns in gentle tones or murmuring to himself some of the great shlokas of the Vedas and the Upanishads. He literally radiated spirituality. Indeed, that same atmosphere of ecstasy and insight that hovered about the Master at Dakshineswar now hovered about the Swami in these strange surroundings in a far-off land. Ale atmosphere of benediction, of peace, of power and of inexpressible luminosity was felt by one and all who came to his classes. It is interesting to read the description of the Swami given by the Phrenological Journal of New York. It reads, Swami Vivekananda is in many respects an excellent specimen of his race. Lai is 5 feet 8 and a half inches in height and weighs 170 pounds. His head measures 21 and THRC fortless inches in circumference by 14 from year to year across the top. He is thus very well proportioned as regards both body and brain. His instincts are too feminine to be compatible with much conjugal sentiment. Indeed, he says himself that he never had the slightest feeling of love for any woman. As he is opposed to war and teaches a religion of unmixed gentleness, W.C. should expect his head to be narrow in the region of the ears at the seat, of combativeness and destructiveness, and such is the case. The same deficiency is much marked in the diameters a little farther up at secretiveness and acquisitiveness. He dismisses the whole subject of finance and ownership by saying that he has no property and does not want to be bothered with any. While such a sentiment sounds odd to American cars, it must be confessed that his face, at least, shows more marks of contentment than the visages of Russell Sage, Haiti Green and many others of our multimillionaires. Firmness and conscientiousness are fully developed. Benevolence is quite conspicuous. Music is well indicated in the width of the temples. The prominent eyes betoken superior memory of words and explain much of the eloquence he has displayed in his lectures. The upper forehead is well developed at casualty and in comparison to which is added a fine endowment of suavity and sense of human nature. Summing up the organization, it will be seen that kindness, sympathy and philosophical intelligence with ambition to achieve success in the direction of higher educational work are his predominant characteristics. Being a graduate of the Calcutta University, Lai speaks English almost as perfectly as if he weak a native of England.
if he does no more than continue the development of that splendid spirit of charity which was displayed at the World's Fair, his mission among us will certainly prove eminently successful. Yet, in spite of the appreciation of the beauty of his character and the grandeur of his mission and leeching, the path before the Swami was not a smooth one. With his great veneration for Jesus the Christ, which all who knew him were aware of, it is almost unbelievable that the Swami was continuously persecuted by sectarian and bigoted Christians who, not satisfied with criticizing his work and philosophy, made attacks upon his personal character. Sometimes notes and letters were sent to persons who had invited him to their homes, which declared that the Swami was not what he represented himself to be, and contained all kinds of calumnies against him. Occasionally these notices had the desired effects, and the Swami would find that the doors of his intended hosts were closed to him. But in most instances, the error would be discovered after a time, and they would call and apologize, and become greater friends than ever. So the obstacles he had to face were enormous, keeping him on edge, as it were, constantly. Everywhere he encountered the weighty opposition of sheer ignorance. Some idea of the difficulties may be gleaned from a letter written to the Brahmavadin in the following year by Swami Kripananda, an American disciple, which is quoted at some length here to show the Swami's mettle. The wonderful success which the Swami Vivekananda achieved in spreading the religious and the philosophical ideas of the Hindus in America, now lead one to the erroneous conclusion that this happy result was due to a coincidence of favorable circumstances, rather than to his extraordinary ability. It is only by studying the fiend de siècle condition of our country, by taking cognizance of the antagonistic forces that had Toho coped with, and considering the numerous difficulties to be overcome in this attempt, that W.C. come to fully appreciate the grandeur of the work accomplished, and to realize that the great success accompanying it is solely due to the personality of the teacher, to his extraordinary moral, intellectual and spiritual endowments, and to his exceptional energy and willpower. It is true that, on the occasion of the Parliament of Religions at Chicago, many Indians succeeded in calling the attention of the world to the light from the East and caused a wave to pass over our country but this wave would have died away as quickly as it had come, without leaving any lasting CLFCCT. Had it not been for the efforts of this one man who unremittingly persisted in grafting the Hindu religious ideas on Western materialism and never rested until his work was crowned with success. At the time the American mind was coated with thick layers of superstition and bigotry that had conic down from olden times and there was no humbug, no charlatanry, no imposition which had not left there an impress extremely difficult to eradicate. The Americans are a receptive nation. That is why the country is a hotbed of all kinds of religious and irreligious monstrosities. There is no theory so absurd, no doctrine so irrational, no claim so extravagant, no fraud so transparent, but can find there numerous believers and a ready market. This morbid craving for the abnormal, the occult, the sensational, has practically brought about a revival of the Middle Ages. To satisfy this craving, to feed the credulity of the people hundreds of societies and sects are born for the salvation of the world and to enable the prophets to pocket $25 to $100 initiation fees. Hobgoblins, spooks, Mahatmas and new prophets were rising every day. In this bedlam of religious cranks, in this devil's kitchen of fraud, imposture and knavery, the Swami appeared to teach the lofty religion of the Vedas, the profound philosophy of the Vedanta, the sublime wisdom of the ancient rishis. The most unfavorable environment lore such a task. Before even starting this great mission, it was necessary to first perform the Herculean labor of cleansing this audience table of imposture, superstition and bigotry, 
a task sufficient to discourage the bravest heart, to despirit the most powerful will. But the Swami was not the man to be deterred by difficulties. Poor and friendless, with no other support than God and His love for mankind, He set patiently to work, determined not to give up until the message He had to deliver would reach the hearts of truth-seeking men and women. In the beginning crowds of people flocked to His lectures, consisting partly of curiosity seekers, partly of the representatives of the cranky and fraudulent elements mentioned before, who thought that they had found in the Swami a proper tool to forward their interests. Most of the latter type of persons tried to induce Him to embrace their cause, first by promises of support, and then by threats of injuring Him if He refused to ally Himself with them. But they were all grievously disappointed. For the first time they had met with a man who could be neither bought nor frightened, the sickle had hit on a stone, as the Polish proverb says. To all these propositions his only answer was, I stand for truth. Truth will never ally itself with falsehood. Even if all the world should be against me, truth must prevail in the end. If he denounced fraud and superstition in whatever guise they appeared, and all those untrue and erratic existences hid themselves, like bats at the approach of daylight, in their haunts before this apostle of truth. The methods and tactics of the Christian missionaries are well known. They would have liked to have the Swami preach Christianity as they understood it, but it could not, should not be, as runs the refrain of the German folk song. Indifferent to the filthy stories they set in circulation about him, he peacefully continued to preach God and love and truth, and their gossip had only advertised his lectures, and gained him the sympathy of all fair-minded people. A worthier antagonist, though not commensurate with his strength, Lai had to meet in another class of people, the so-called freethinkers, embracing the atheists, materialists, agnostics, rationalists, and all those who, on principle, are averse to anything that savours of religion. They thought that this Hindu monk was an easy match for them, and that all his theology would be crushed under the weight of Western civilization, Western philosophy, and Western science. So sure were they of their triumph, that they invited him, in New York, to lecture before their society, anxious to show to their numerous followers how easily religious claims could be refuted by the powerful arguments of their logic and pure reasoning. I shall never forget that memorable evening when the Swami appeared single-handed to face the forces of materialism, arrayed in their heaviest armour of law asterisk, and reason, and logic, and common sense, of matter, and force, and heredity, and all the stock phrases calculated to awe and terrify the ignorant. Imagine their surprise and consternation when they found that, far from being intimidated by these big words, he proved himself a master in wielding their own weapons, and as familiar with the arguments of materialism as with those of the Advat philosophy. He showed them that their much-wanted Western civilization consisted principally in the development of the art to destroy their fellowmen, that their Western science could not answer the most vital questions of life and being, that their immutable loss, so much talked of, had no outside existence apart from the human mind, that the very idea of matter was a metaphysical conception, and that it was the much dispersed metaphysics upon which ultimately rested the very basis of their materialism. With an irresistible logic he demonstrated that their knowledge proved itself incorrect, not by comparison with knowledge which is true, but by the very laws upon which it depends for its basis, that pure reasoning could not help admitting its own limitations and pointed to something beyond reason, and that rationalism when carried to its last consequences must ultimately land us at a something which is above matter, above force, above sense, above thought and even consciousness, and of which. All these are but manifestations. The powerful effect of this lecture could be seen on the following day, 
When numbers of the materialistic camp came to sit at the feet of the Hindu monk and listen to his sublime utterances on God and religion, thus the Swami gathered around himself, from among the most heterogeneous classes of society a large and ever-increasing following of sincere men and women animated with the only desire to pursue truth for truth's OWII sake. This is a delineation of the negative side of the Swami's work. He had first to clear the ground and lay a deep foundation for the grand edifice to be built. More and more, as time went on, the Swami found himself winning, to a greater and still greater extent, the confidence and the respect, and even the reverence, of large numbers of people in America. Many of these devoted themselves heart and soul to His work and became His followers in a definite sense. Meanwhile, his disciples in India were looking up to him for guidance, sending him numerous letters and even begging him to return to India, to which his reply was that they should depend upon themselves, believe in themselves and march on. The Swami seemed, in some aspects, to have the strength of a military leader. His letters charging and inciting them to work were always military in character and intensity and his reprimands and words of encouragement were alike replete with martial enthusiasm. He had no patience with lack of self-confidence, and his constant watchword was, Stand on your own feet. He wrote, If you are really my children, you will fear nothing, stop at nothing. You will be like lions. We must rouse India and the whole world. All his letters to India at this time are filled with this spirit and with a remarkable penetration into the nature of Indian problems. His comments on Christianity during this period are also interesting. In a letter he writes as follows, At the very time of the agitation against him by missionary bodies in America, and it is mentioned to show the great generosity and kindly spirit of the Swami. The Christianity that is preached in India is quite different from what one sees here. You will be astonished to hear that I have friends in this country amongst the clergy of the Episcopal and even Presbyterian churches, who are as broad, as liberal and as sincere as you are in your own religion. The real spiritual man is broad everywhere. His love forces him to be so. Those to whom religion is a trade, are forced to become narrow and mischievous by their introduction into religion of the competitive, fighting and selfish methods of the world. When his Indian friends had sent to him the missionary criticism concerning himself and his work, he answered, In future do not pay any heed to what people say either for or against me. I shall work incessantly until I die. And even after death I shall work for the good of the world. Truth is infinitely more weighty than untruth. It is the force of character, of purity and of truth of personality. So long as I have these things you can feel easy. No one will he able to injure a hair of my head. If they try they will fail, say silly the Lord. Probably none other of the Swami's writings are so surcharged with the apostolic fire of His own personality as His letters and particularly His letters written at this time to His Guru Bhais and His Indian devotees. These abound with such fine utterances as the following taken at random. Dot I do not care whether they are Hindus or Mohammedans or Christians, but those that love the Lord will always command my service. Plunge into the fire and bring people towards the Lord. Everything will come to you if you have faith. I always pray for you, you must pray for me. Let each one of us pray day and night for the downtrodden millions in India who are held fast by poverty, priestcraft and tyranny, pray day and night for them. I care more to preach religion to them than to the high and the rich. I am no metaphysician, no philosopher, nay, no saint. I am poor, I love the poor. 
who feels in India for the 200 millions of men and women sunken forever in poverty and ignorance? Where is the way out? Who feels for them? They cannot find light or education. Who will bring a light to them? Who will travel from door to door bringing education to them? Let these people he your God think of them, work for them, pray for them incessantly, the Lord will show you the way. Him I call a Mahatmafi, whose heart bleeds for the poor, otherwise, he is a Duralma. We may die unknown, unpitied, unbewailed, without accomplishing anything, hut not one thought will he lost. It will take effect sooner or later. So long as the millions live in hunger and ignorance, I hold every man a traitor who, having been educated at their expense, pays not the least heed to them I. We are poor, my brothers, we are nobodics, but such have always been the instruments of the Most High. I only want men to follow me, who can be true and faithful unto death. I, it, not care for success or non-success. I must keep my movement pure, or I will have none of it. India's doom was sealed the very day they invented the word emicha and stopped from communion with others. An organization that will teach the Hindus mutual help and appreciation is absolutely necessary. Work among those young men who can devote heart and soul to this one duly, the duty of raising the masses of India. Cultivate the virtue of obedience. No centralization is possible unless there is obedience to superiors. No great work can be done without this centralization of individual force. Give up jealousy and conceit. Learn to work unitedly for others. This is the great need of our country. The letters that the Swami sent constantly to India, both to his disciples in Madras and northern India and to his Guru Bhais in the monastery at Barnagore, had almost the same value as his presence. They encouraged all who read them, they made them ambitious to do and to serve, and one finds many of his disciples earnestly devoting themselves, at his bidding, to the carrying out of his plans and ideas. After he started his systematic work in New York, the Swami constantly urged His disciples in Madras to launch a magazine on Vedantic lines. He even helped them to carry out this project by sending them enough money from the proceeds of His secular lectures and the magazine called Brahmavdin came into existence. He begged them to study the Sanskrit scriptures and gave the following suggestions in a letter from New York dated 6th May 1895 as to the lines on which the journal was to be conducted. Now I will tell you my discovery. All of religion is contained in the Vedanta, that is, in the three stages of the Vedanta philosophy, the Dvaita, the visit Isht Advait and Advait, one comes after the other. These are the three stages of spiritual growth in Mart. Every one is necessary. This is the essential of religion, the Vedanta applied to the various ethnic customs and creeds of India is Hinduism. The first stage, I Dvaita, applied to the ideas of the ethnic groups of Europe, is Christianity as applied to the Semitic groups, Mohammedanism, the Advait as applied in its yoga perception form, is Buddhism. Now, by religion is meant the Vedanta, the applications must vary according to the different needs surroundings and other circumstances of different nations. You will find that although the philosophy is the same, the Shaktas, Shavas and others apply it, each to their own special cult and forms. Now, in your journal write article after article on these three systems, showing their harmony as one following after the other and at the same time avoiding the ceremonial forms altogether. That is, preach the philosophy, the spiritual part, and let people suit it to their own forms. The journal must not be lippant but steady, calm and high-toned. Be perfectly unselfish, be steady and work on. 
Thus the Swami was also ushering some work in India and guiding it through letters from distant America. He was preparing a field for himself when he would return back to India. To return to a further consideration of the Swami's work with his classes in New York, the nature of it was largely that of Raja Yoga and Janana Yoga. He taught the students the path of practical spirituality by the inner control of the senses through Raja Yoga to still the mind and to subordinate the sense impulses to reason, in short, to spiritualize the whole personality. Meditation was the key to spirituality and he held regular classes in which the students were taught to concentrate. The Swami himself spent long hours in meditation, squatting on the ground in the yogi fashion as in India. Thus the students learned how to overcome physical consciousness and to realize the potential divinity within them. They learned that religion was not a question of belief but of practice, and they began to practice under the Swami's guidance systematically certain spiritual and physical exercises by which equilibrium of the body and the mind could be established. In order to achieve success, the Swami enjoined on the students the necessity of absolutely pure lives and of simple sattvika food, else grave mental and physical disorders, and even insanity, might result. Thus his classes took on the aspect of monastic gatherings, permitting the highest flights of philosophy and spiritual recollectedness. He warned his students against the occult, pointing out that psychic powers were impediments to real spiritual progress and only diverted one from the right path. The Swami was almost violent in his denunciation of the sects or persons who subordinated spirituality to that grossest of all superstitions, psychic powers. And the Swami put into practice that which He preached. Thus one sees Him in His New York retreat, in the morning or the evening quiet, or at dead of night, meditating. Oftentimes He was lost in meditation, His unconsciousness of the external betraying His complete absorption within. And the Swami was preeminently fitted to teach the practices of meditation. Having practiced innumerable forms of meditation under the guidance of His Master and possessing a mind informed of all the details and intricacies in the experience of its different states, He was qualified to know the tendency of every disciple and to develop everyone according to His special tendencies, giving every disciple in accordance with His nature a special ideal and special form of meditation. His scientific turn of mind gave Him a deep insight into the rationale of yoga exercises and therefore He could analyze His own experiences and those of His disciples, endeavoring at all times to give a subjective rather than an objective interpretation to the visions and phenomena of meditation and His counsel was to test everything by reason. Whatever he taught to his disciples, he said that he had himself experienced. His theories of the anatomy of the nervous system and of its relations to the brain, his statements as to the relation between states of mind and nervous changes, drew the attention of a great number of noted American physicians and physiologists, some of whom championed his theories, avowing that they contained truths concerning the functions of the body which were worthy of careful investigation. His claim that meditation brought about the extension and development of the human faculties and produced supernormal experiences, hitherto classified as miraculous phenomena, interested the foremost American psychologists, particularly Professor William James of Harvard University. But his personal disciples were concerned with the spiritual rather than the academic side of religious study and their efforts at meditation continued unabated. His lectures at this time were replete with the deepest philosophical insight and with extraordinary outbursts of devotion, revealing his nature as essentially a combination of the jnani and bhakta, the saint and true mystic in one. Sometimes it would seem as if the veils that blind the spiritual vision were rent and the Swami would stand before His classes a veritable knower of the Self. His hours were not employed in meditation, 
in private or class teaching, or in replying to various correspondents, were consumed in the pursuit of secular knowledge which he absorbed and turned to spiritual account. The flow of life in the Western world interested him. He was also engaged at this time in penning those immortal thoughts that have become embodied in his now famous work, R.D. Jayoga, and which were originally given as class lectures in his New York Center. It was some time about June that he completed R.D. Jayoga. The manner in which he wrote this is of exceeding interest. His staunch disciple, Miss S. E. Waldo of Brooklyn, was his amanuensis, and she says, It was inspiring to see the Swami as he dictated to me the contents of the work. In delivering one two's commentaries on the sutras, he would leave me waiting while he entered deep stales of meditation or self-contemplation to emerge therefrom with some luminous interpretation. I had always to keep the pen dipped in the ink. He might be absorbed for long periods of time and then suddenly his silence would be broken by some eager expression or some long deliberate teaching. Day after day the Swami was in this constant atmosphere of intense rcc electedness and deep intellectual work, teaching Raja Yoga, practicing it, writing about it. That the Swami maintained the meditative habit throughout his Western life was remarkable, for the disturbances were innumerable. Oftentimes, whilst those about him were talking vivaciously, it would be noticed that the Swami's eyes would grow fixed, his breath would come slower and slower till there would be a pause and then a gradual return to consciousness of his environment. It is said of him. His friends knew these things and provided for them. If he walked into the house to pay a call and forgot to speak, or if he was found in a room, in silence, no one disturbed him, though he would sometimes rise and render assistance to an intruder without breaking the train of thought. Thus his interest lay within, and not without. To the scale and range of his thought his conversation was of course our only clue. The Swami had already made ardent admirers, and even disciples of many distinguished persons. It was his earnest desire to initiate a few as sannyasins, and to train them so that they would be fitted to carry on his American work in his absence. Two had already become his proclaimed disciples, though they had not as yet received actual initiation into sannyasa. These were Madame Marie Louise and Herr Leon Landsberg. The description of these two followers of the Swami is best given in the New York Herald a few months after they received sannyasa in the summer of 1895. Took jute from the paper. The Swami Abhyananda is a French woman, but naturalized and 25 years resident of New York. She has a curious history. For a quarter of a century, she has been known to liberal circles as a materialist, socialist. Twelve months ago she was a prominent member of the Manhattan Liberal Club. Then she was known in the press and on the platform as mine. Marie Louise, a fearless, progressive, advanced woman, whose boast it was that she was always in the forefront of the battle and ahead of her times. The second disciple is also an enthusiast. With skill which Vivekananda shows in all his dealings with men, the Hindu has chosen his first disciples well. I he Swami Kripananda, before he was taken into the circle and took the woes of poverty and chastity, was a newspaper man, employed on the staff of one of the most prominent New York papers. By birth he is a Russian Jew named Leon Landsberg and, if it were Noel L, his life history is probably as interesting as that of Swami Abhyananda. Among others who were devoted to the Swami's teachings were Mrs. Ole Bull, wife of the celebrated violinist and Norwegian nationalist Dr. Alan Day, Miss S. E. Waldo, Professors Wyman and Wright, Dr. Street, and many clergymen and laymen of note.